Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and it's been a nail biter today. Ethereum and XRP have been battling for that second position on coin market cap. It's a very narrow spread, but as you can see, Ethereum has overtaken XRP with a 9% gain. XRP has a 2.7% gain. When we look at the 100 coins on coin market cap, the top 100, more than 90% are in the green today. And I think I might have found one of the factors to push us in that direction, and I'll cover that in this video. First, I want to take a look at this tweet by Trace Mare. He is the organizer of Proof of Keys. That is a campaign where everybody is encouraged to remove their holdings from any third party exchange on January 3rd. Why? To prove the exchanges really have our coins. Now, I think this is important because as we know, too many people are leaving their coins on the exchanges. Just look at the hack that occurred in Japan back in January 2018 on CoinCheck, 540 million US dollars was lost and uh, it shouldn't have been that high. So we have to really, really be careful. Now, why do so many people leave it on the exchange? Mm, it could be complacency. It could be though that people are just not confident as to how to use those hardware devices to get them off the exchange, or maybe there is just too much trust. I'm not sure, but I do believe that the campaign that Trace has um, put forth is going to increase the awareness and I'm um, all behind it. However, I do worry about some negative occurrences that could happen. I don't know, but this is a very critical time for the market to regain its momentum and market sentiment. And I worry that if uh, we have some of these problems like um, pushing the weaker exchanges into the corner that causes them to disappear with people's coins could be disastrous. And we might see a lot of mandatory maintenance because there's just too many requests on one single day to handle uh, what's being asked of the exchanges that don't have that support in place. Or we could see frozen accounts or like in this tweet where hit BTC has told a user who tried to take his coins off that the withdrawals are temporarily disabled um, from that account. And that is a really scary thing. And if we see lots of this, uh, it could be just the fodder that those media outlets who love to write negative stories are going to jump on. So I really hope it goes smoothly without any big disasters. Okay, this is interesting, and this could be why we're seeing a little bit of green today. Sarsen's Funds, they are a hedge fund manager. They're one of 900 that operate globally. 650 of those, by the way, are in the United States. And he says, um, just remember, these guys have very unique insight. And he said that um, John Sarsen's uh, is quoted as saying that many of the clients that come late to the um, hedge funds to be um, serviced, if you will, for an account are told to just hold off. So those that come late, like in November and December, they are holding those deposits to put those orders through so that their clients don't have to file a K-1 form. And that is why he thinks January 2nd is going to be a big day uh, for sales. So maybe that is really what we're seeing. And boy, on Twitter today, this was a huge story. So according to the Twitter account Whale Alert, there was more than one billion in US dollars of XRP that changed hands in a matter of minutes. And those XRP uh, were divided into seven different transactions. The largest one, by the way, was more than a billion XRP coins 
that, um, that just moved in a transaction that, you know, nobody really knows for sure. Although we do see that some of them come from uh, uh, Ripple escrow, which is totally um, not a surprise because we know as per Ripple's quarterly results, we know that three billion of those coins within the quarter that are not used return back to escrow. And if you take a look here, um, Green Eggs and Ham does a really good job at tracking the movement. And today he was one of the active ones on Twitter with everyone talking about the uh, addresses that he has previously tagged, which give him a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So on BitHump, you can take a look at any XRP uh, transaction on the ledger. And you can see here that what he does is he sends a tiny bit amount from his XRP tip bot and then adds a note so that as this movement occurs month after month, he can kind of get an idea of where it was moved prior or how it was moved before, and then it sheds a little light as to what's going on. So it's not a huge surprise that we see this being the first of the month, but everybody always loves to speculate, if you will. Um, just so you know that only 13% of the total XRP in circulation are under that kind of control, where if you look at Bloomberg, um, just to compare, because sometimes people think that there's too much control of the coins from Ripple, but really, um, that's just not the case. When we look at Bitcoin, 20 to 30 percent of all those coins are held by the miners. That's a huge amount, and that source comes from Lucas Nuzzi, who is a very credible source, and Bloomberg covered that in a story. You can search that if you like. So um, the 1 billion uh, XRP that are let out of that cryptographic escrow actually are returned back to the escrow every um, quarter that aren't used or aren't sold on the OTC. So here you see, this is the actual Department of Financial Services back in 2016. This is the subsidiary of Ripple called XRP2. Uh, and it is a registered and licensed money service business. <clears throat> in Q3, it actually sold 98 million XRP and I just found it interesting to actual, actually find the certificate of when they received their license on the 13th of June, 2016. Okay. Well, coming back to Japan, we see that DMM is also, along with GMO, exiting crypto mining and manufacturing of miners, which is, yeah, just you know, in, in regards to this uh, smaller and smaller and smaller amount of people that are doing the mining, it just puts uh, too much trust, I think, in the hands of very, very few. And I am sad to see that DMM and DMO have decided to get out of the mining business. So it became official today and they made this announcement. This was their location in the city of Kanazawa and they had, I think, nearly 1,000 um, rigs in this particular location and they had earlier made the announcement that they wanted to be the top three world's mining farms in terms of scale, but it looks like they are going to have to abandon that particular goal. I'm, I'm, I am sad to see this news. All right, this is, this is wonderful from the XRP community. This is Leonidas, and he did his very first 
blog on the um, XRP community blog, and it is a good one. And if you are wanting to see why it was so exciting to cover XRP this last year, this article or this blog will easily show you why, because it recaps the year in great detail. And boy, was it a great year. And it was a uh, it's a wonderful job, Leonidas, of documenting everything that occurred. And not only do I think it is good, <laughs> yeah, Dilip Rao, who is, of course, uh, one of the deal makers in Ripple, he thought it was so good. You actually got an XRP tip through the tip bot from him. I thought that was just fantastic. So congratulations, congratulations, Leonidas, on uh, work well done. And I wasn't the only one along with the leap that thought it was great. Uh, just a couple of hours ago, the Daily Hoddle also quoted the um, Leonid Leonidas's blog in their article where they wrote he had an extensive review on the biggest developments for the company and the digital assets in Q4 2018. Yeah, it was really, of all the quarters, Q4 was really super exciting. So here are some of the highlights and of course, a link to the XRP community blog where you can read them all. I really think it's worth um, taking a look and enjoying his work. So, all right. So we are gonna jump into the fluff now if you are new to this channel, I always talk about something culturally uh, from Japan at the very end. And today I have to cover the osechi, which is the three tiered boxed meal that everybody eats over the three days of the New Year holiday. So you need to say, Akemashite omedetto gozaimasu, which means Happy New Year. And that is. Uh, what you must be able to say along with your sayonara and and konnichiwa because it is a big deal here in japan um, this is an example of a very fancy one it is um, with a lot of seafood and so of course the lobster probably brings a price upwards in the way of maybe 500 us dollars for this box but don't let that price scare you because you can get into um, Osechi meals at the convenience stores like 7-Eleven does a really fabulous one for just $150. And the most important thing to talk about is that um, all of these foods have a very deep meaning and uh, they are symbolic. So this is actually um, komaboku. It is a fish cake and the uh, color combination is symbolizing the rising sun. And then here we have the kuromame, which is a black bean, and it symbolizes good health. And here is kazunoko. Uh, that is a um, herring row, and the symbol there is to have many children. So it's kind of a, a symbol of fertility. And then we have, um, what else do we have? We have tazukuri, which is the candied sardines up here. Those are really, really, really yummy. It is to celebrate the coming abundant harvest. And let's see, Ebi, where are you, Ebi? This is the shrimp, and this symbolizes longevity. So there is really um, just too many yummy things to mention here, but all of which have some sort of important symbol. And in the days of the Heian period, it was actually part of the um, aristocratic families who would participate in a seasonal festival, if you will. And it was really part of the imperial court. But now it is for everyday Japanese and they um, are able to give the mom a break, uh, or whoever's doing the cooking, usually it's the mom in Japan, but not always, but it usually, um, 
gives the mother a break from having to do any cooking for the first three days of the new year so that they can relax and enjoy the family. And everybody nibbles on this preserved food for three days. And I found something a little bit fun. These are two guys who are in Japan that have a YouTube channel and they actually do a live unboxing of the 7-Eleven Osechi and they talk about it and then test it out. It's really a great video. I'll put the link to it in the comment section below. I'm just sure you will enjoy this and you'll learn about the food that is so often found in these boxes. Okay, everybody, that's all I have for you today. Do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.